Zakal Wanchao. I'm a pastor and I'm a marriage and family therapist. And today I want to invite you to the second installment of a video series that is trying to answer the question of why. Why is it some families have been hit so severely by COVID and others not as much? And even much more importantly, what should families in distress be doing at this time to alleviate their stress levels? That's what we've been sharing uh, in this video series. I, I want to first of all begin by thanking you so much for your participation. I have noticed that there have been quite a number of shares and I want to say thank you. You know, let us share these talks. I'm sure we do have family members, we have neighbors, um, we do have friends who will benefit. And so please share as widely as possible these videos. I mean, let's spread the hope at this time of COVID. And I also want to thank you so much for your questions. I want to thank you for your comments. Um, please, you know, as you join, be sure to tell us where you're, where you're joining from. Uh, the last time we had people as far as from Berlin. And so if you're from Berlin, welcome. I hope to see you again today, but welcome everyone. I mean, I'm really excited about today and, and, and what we're going to be discussing. Now, as usual, I'll be reading some questions that I have received this week. And I have selected some two that I want us to discuss today. And the first one is by a guy called uh, CN. And this is what he says. He says, thank you, Pastor Carol. The talk was very helpful and you're right. I recognize that our issues already existed, um, you know, and COVID has just compounded the matter. The not talking together is very real and also very painful. My wife simply refuses to engage with me and has also refused to seek counsel. I feel at the end of my rope. That is CN. Wow. BA, uh, again, this is another guy, BA, and he says, uh, Thank you, Pastor Carol, for your insightful talk. I heard you when you said that we should take initiative in the family to avert crisis. I'm, however, very tired. In my marriage, it appears that I'm the only one who takes initiative while my wife does nothing. I'm carrying all the weight in the house, including what I thought women should carry. How do I get my wife motivated to do anything in the house? I mean, for, for BA and for CN, I feel you. It's crazy. What do you do with unres unresponsive spouses? For BA, you're carrying all the weight. And I can tell that even for CN, you're very frustrated at your wife's unresponsiveness. Now, if you missed the first video, I would say go ahead and watch it. Uh, this is a video where we introduce the concept of, uh, you know, of foundations. And the fact that our current crisis, uh, the way that we're experiencing the current crisis, is pointing to the kind of foundations that uh, our marriages are built on right now. We had said that a strong foundation you know, will support storms and crises, whereas a weak foundation cannot you know, support a crisis adequately enough. Uh, we had also said that foundations take a while to rebuild. And so, you know, we are saying be patient with ourselves. We should be patient with ourselves because foundations do take a while to, to rebuild. Uh, also, in the first video, we had introduced, you know, the first building block, which he had stated as being proactive. Now, being proactive is taking a hold of those issues where we have felt frustrated about and taking action so as to avert crisis. And so I'd want to say for both BA and CN, well done. Well done for trying to hold things together, you know. At least, um, you know, things are holding up. Uh, the problem, though, is that, you're, you know, you're carrying way too much weight. And a marriage, you know, is between two adults. So, uh, you know, uh, with every person bearing their own load. And so, but at least well done uh, for taking initiative. So the question we're asking today is, what to do with an unresponsive spouse? You know, for BA and CN, you know, you're not the only ones, you know, feeling that you have taken the initiative and have ended up bearing the whole load. So what should we do with unresponsive spouses? And, you know, to answer this question, I want to add to that first building block, you know, where we had said, you know, being proactive. I want us to build another building block, which I'm calling emotional intelligence uh, today. And uh, just for purposes of definition, you know, simply put, uh, emotional I intelligence or EQ is, is the ability to be self-aware. You know, you're self-aware. 
to be self-aware of your emotions, uh, to be control in control of these emotions, and also to have the ability to express these emotions in an empathetic manner, in a way that builds people up. And it's amazing. That is what emotional uh, intelligence is about. And uh, there's a verse uh, in the Bible that just captures this definition so well, you know, I was so pleasantly surprised to come across it. And this is Ephesians 4.29, and this is what it says. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And, and this verse, I, I just find it very, very interesting because it says, begin with the end user in mind very interestingly it is other centered uh it's saying our communication with people and yes including our spouse should be for the sake of building them up it seeks to build others up so just for example this is the way that it works it will say hi how was your day uh what were your highs and what were your lows today or how can I pray to you as you start your day? Or, you know what, I'm in the shop, what can I get for you, okay? So I, I want to tell you a story of a friend of mine who was at the salon and you know she, she overheard this conversation with a male hairdresser who was uh, talking to his client. And she was like, whoa, you know, it, it was such an interesting conversation. And what was happening is that this guy was showering this lady with a lot of attention. He seemed to know where she worked. He, know, he knew the politics and stresses that she was going through. He knew her allies and her foes in her office. I mean, he was so empathetic and understanding. Now, as you can tell, even as my friend was telling me this story, I mean, this uh, hairdresser was really up to no good. But in actual fact, what he was modeling is the kind of concern uh, and conversations that couples should have for one another. You know, just that ability to set some time apart, you know, to catch up, uh, to enter into each other's worlds. Uh, and we're not talking, we're not, you know, catching up on the kids or even the bills. It's simply to catch up as friends. But sadly, these are not the kind of conversations that couples have. I mean, for many of us, our conversations are normally filled, you know, with arguments, uh, criticism of one another, uh, belittling, uh, putting uh, each other down, you know, filled with outbursts of anger and moodiness. They are, they are not the kind of conversations that leave one refreshed and eager for more interactions. Indeed, you know, if we could really be honest, some of the conversations we have leave us angry, they leave us depressed, you know, they lead, you know, some people to violence, or they might even lead some people to seeking comfort in other people's arms or even the bottle. So I, I remember, you know, when, when we were growing up, whenever my, we misbehaved, my mom would look at us and, you know, she would ask us, so where did you get that behavior from? I mean, do you see me or your father doing that? You know, or when we were in school, teachers would ask, so whose child are you? Who is your mother? Who is your father? And it's almost like in exasperation, these adults around us are, are trying to understand, you know, kids' behavior, you know, trying to figure out where the presenting behavior is coming from. And in the same way, the question to ask is, where do we learn how to socialize? Where do we learn how to communicate? Where do we learn how to relate with other people? In other words, where is our emotional intelligence developed? Now, you know, there are various theories. Uh, there are people who will argue and say it has everything to do with your personality. You know, uh, others will say it is the, or so, you know, only the, you know, it's as a result of your parenting. But I believe that it has to do with the both, you know. Um, our personality is the way that um, we were born. Our personality is what predisposes us to certain behavior, you know, like being shy or being sensitive or uh, being easily angered or being moody or being manipulative, you know, and, I, and that is the way that we're born. And I want to call this our baseline behavior. Uh, it is what we are born with. Uh, but parenting now comes along and coaches the child, you know, on how to interact with people and even how to live with them. So 
I take the child, for example, you know, who easily gets angry and, and bursts into uh, temper tantrums and even hits other people. Or, or the child who clams up and, and gets moody. Uh, both of these need to be coached and taught how their behavior is affecting other people. Uh, or take, for example, the child with anger issues uh, should be taught empathy. Uh, they should be taught, you know, the effect of yelling and hitting other people. Exactly what does that do for people? Uh, the child who is bossy and controlling should be taught how others experience being controlled. I mean, nobody likes to be controlled. No one likes it. Instead, they can be shown how to listen to others and also how to allow other, other people to take a turn. Uh, the child who airs their views with little consideration uh, for others should be coached to understand that other people's views also matter. And, and they should also be taught how to elicit, uh, not just to how to elicit, but also how to value other people's views. So learning to relate with others, learning how to take turns, learning how to listen, learning how to be kind, learning how to care for others, are skills that determine a person's emotional intelligence. And so it goes on to say that the more one is able to relate with other people, and specifically their spouse, because you know their spouse is not impressed with anything, uh, the higher their emotional intelligence. And, and the opposite is true. The less one is able to relate with their spouse without dissolving into tears or ending up in a shouting match, the less developed their EQ. And I must say, I mean, even as I, even as I say this, I do recognize my own issues. Uh, you know, for the longest time, we could not have a conversation with my husband without me, you know, <laughs> dissolving into tears. Uh, but I think the helpful thing is to understand, you know, that yes, there is something called an undeveloped uh, EQ. So how does an undeveloped EQ, you know, play out amongst uh, couples? Uh, in every marriage, there's one person who expresses themselves easier. Uh, and in fact, their complaint is usually, you know, my spouse is non-communicative, my spouse does not talk, my spouse stonewalls, you know. Uh, so we do have the person who's really communicative. Uh, however, unknown uh, to this very communicative spouse, their communication often involves dumping issues and negative emotions on their spouse with little regard of how this is affecting their spouse. And, and what the non-communicative spouse then ends up doing is retreating. When they retreat, the communicative spouse gets even more exasperated and in their anger and desperation will result in quarrels, they result in put downs, you know, ridicule, disrespect, uh, emotional abuse, and even sometimes violence. And what this happens then is that the non-communicative spouse retreats even further. Uh, they retreat, uh, you know, uh, you know, and result to escapism, uh, which can be, you know, as innocent as burying themselves in work, uh, staying out late uh, at night, you know, maybe with drinking buddies. Uh, you know, that was the reality BC before COVID, but now after COVID, that is now not possible. Uh, they may retreat and have, you know, another family. Um, or they may engage in addiction such as pornography, or they might even retreat to the bottle. Now, what I have just described is, is known as the aggressor and passive aggressive dance. And unfortunately, unless this dance is stopped, um, it continues to cause the couple further problems. And I'm going to mention a couple of them. The first problem is lack of intimacy. Uh, the passive aggressive spouse fears letting their spouse into their business. You know, they fear being vulnerable to them. They fear sharing their hopes. Uh, they fear sharing their aspirations, sharing their bank account details. Uh, they fear sharing their plans. And as if this is not enough, like a domino effect, lack of intimacy leads to further problems for this couple. And the second problem is this, an inability to pursue common financial goals or even their, uh, and, and an inability to plan for a common future together. Now, when a couple have no plans together, where they will experience COVID or any other crisis as a severe threat. They're going to experience high anxiety and, high, and, and, and a lot of fear because they have no plans together. And the problem with fear is that it can paralyze someone so much 
that they are unable to think. They are unable to come up with solutions to manage the crisis. And unfortunately, they are completely blinded and they are unable to see the solutions that are within their grasp that can make their situation better. So from what I have shared, you know, you can see just the problems of having an undeveloped, underdeveloped uh, emotional intelligence. But I want to say I thank God. I thank God that this can change. I, I thank God that this can be improved. The truth be told, parents do not understand their role in helping develop their child's EQ. If, if anything, you know, many parents will feel as long as I'm taking my child to school and helping them grow in their knowledge, that is all that I need to do. Then many of us, you know, do not know our role in helping our children, you know, just learn how to relate with other people. And a lot of times we normally say, this is the way the child is, you know, they're just shy or they're just selfish or they're just angry, you know, or whatever it is, not understanding that we are called to coach a child and help them grow. But you know what? I believe that as an adult, you can choose to develop your EQ. And with God, nothing is impossible. And, and I'd just like to share with you a few guidelines of how beginning this week, you can begin to grow, you can begin to change, you can begin to influence and, and develop your EQ or your emotional intelligence. Now, as I have said before, these sessions or these videos that, are, that, are, you, you know, uh, that I'm putting up are supposed to be extremely practical to help you overcome whatever hurdle that you're experiencing in your relationship at this time. In fact, I'd want you know, for you to consider this as a time of marital coaching or marital counseling. You know, this is what you will get if you paid for professional counseling. And so I'd encourage you take a note of, you know, the things that we're discussing and, you know, be sure to practice them. So the first step um, in, in, in your growth and development, the first thing that I'd like you to do is to do a PACS. Now, PACS, if you remember, is, is what we used to say as kids uh, to indicate ceasefire or, you know, to say peace, you know, to say peace. Agree on a ceasefire with your spouse. Uh, you know, in the last video, we gave a strategy of, of what to do with the urgent matters that are pressing us as families. And we had said, you know what, you actually really do need to discuss or, or, or to, you know, to, to make a plan for your bills like rent, you know, just those things that can put your family down. And we said, you know, do that, you know, do whatever it takes uh, to avert any crisis. But once you have done that, once you have dispensed you know, with these urgent matters, then put a pax on all issues to allow you to focus on what you need to do at this time, which is to rebuild your foundations. Secondly, create time in your schedule for reflection. And this is so crucial. Uh, Socrates, the great uh, philosopher, is said to have coined the famous saying, which I, I love and actually which I live by. And it says that an examined life is not worth living and 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 what this is saying is that an examined life is a life where things happen issues happen to a person and you find this person just backpedaling you know as things happen they don't they don't seem to have a control on the things that are happening to them so for example take the person who is violent if you are to ask them what triggers your anger they will normally point to their spouse and blame their spouse not understanding that there is an inner deep-seated emotion that their spouse just happened to touch, but it was there all along. And so finding time for reflection and for introspection is something that, you know, that will really be of benefit uh, for you at this particular time. And I, I do have some questions that I, I want you, you know, as you're, as you're journaling to reflect on. And, you know, there's just a few of them which I want you to take a note of. And the first one is, how was conflict handled in your parents' home? How was that handled? Uh, secondly, how did you experience it personally? Uh, third, how did that influence the way you're currently managing conflict with your spouse? And fourth, how is your current conflict style affecting your spouse? You will be surprised that as you explore just your home and, and just just how conflict was handled, you'll be surprised to see how it is impacting you at this particular time. 
The third thing I want you to do is to invite Jesus into your pain. To invite Jesus into your past. As you journal and you realize, oh gosh, you know, there are these things that happened. There were, you know, bad things or terrible things that happened. I'd like you to invite Jesus into your pain. Invite him to heal you. This is your healing prayer. You're, in a sense, inviting God to, to, you know, into your life to heal you. If you notice that you've become, you know, a vindictive, a bitter person, an angry or suspicious person, then this is the place to actually note these as spirits. You know, these are spirits of anger, of bitterness, of rebellion, of pride or depression. Whatever it is, command them to live in Jesus' name. And instead, invite, you know, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Invite him to take over uh, your life and to fill you with his spirit of joy, his spirit of love, of peace, of patience, and so on. And you will begin to notice when the Holy Spirit come on, comes on you, you will notice a change and you're going to begin to reflect uh, his personality. You're going to become more loving, more patient, more joyful. You're going to become more kind. You're going to become more mindful of other people. But that's only as you get rid of you know the negative spirits that are in you and invite the holy spirit to come into you instead the other thing is to confess to your spouse you're wrong the ways that you have wronged them ask them to forgive you um, for the wrongs uh, in the very best of circumstances your spouse will receive your act graciously and you'll kiss and make up <laughs> that's the very best of the situation but again, depending on how long, you know, your, you know, your, your situation has been running, especially if it has been very conflictual and very painful, then your spouse may not respond in kind. Indeed, they will be, expect, they might actually get suspicious. But I will say that's okay. Don't take it personally. You have done your part. You're seeking forgiveness from your spouse. Gives God permission to come into your marriage and to begin the healing process. And I just want to say, be patient and wait and see what God does. Now, would you believe it? That's all the time that we have for this evening. Uh, as I had said, this is, you know, our sessions are supposed to be very practical when you get ideas of how you can grow, you know, together during uh, this crisis. Um, and, and so I want to say, keep your comments and questions coming. We really just appreciate interacting with you. If you have any feedback, we are very open, you know, to that as well. Uh, if you'd like to be part of the Mavuno community, you know, to receive prayer and support from one of our pastors, click on the link below, uh, indicate that you would like prayer. Also say where you live so the pastor who lives near you can give you a call. And if you have found this content to be helpful, please share it share it with your friends with your family with your neighbors even with your foes <laughs> this is the time to really uh, spread hope uh, to other people who you know need uh, the hope uh, i'd like to end with prayer and um just as i did last week I, I didn't have the book with me but this is the book that i was i shared with you it's called the negativity fast uh, it's a book that i said was written by somebody you know, who was really fed up. It's a lady who was really fed up. She's a friend of mine, uh, fed up about all the negativity that was going on around her. And she decided, let me do something about it and let me write about it. And, you know, it's a devotional. It has just such amazing nuggets, uh, truths that can really help, uh, 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 you know, just go through a crisis. Uh, so today, this is what um, she writes. She says, the miracle is not the getting out of the storm but the fact that we can master the art of sleeping through the storm. And in this thought, she's talking about, she's, you know, reflecting or, or talking about or referencing the time when Jesus was with his disciples and, you know, they were out in a boat and they were experiencing a, a heavy storm and Jesus was asleep and they cried out to him and they asked Jesus, don't you care? We are about to drown. And I know that for some of you, you know, at this time you're saying, Lord, you know, I cannot even feel you. Are you around? We are about to drown. At this time you know as a family and 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 i love what she says that the miracle is not getting out of the storm but rather that we can master the art of sleeping through the storm and the only way that we can do this is when we know that jesus is with us in the boat and i'd like to end up by saying that jesus is in the boat with us he has the ability to calm the storm 
All we need to do is to be still and to call on him. And so I'd like us to pray. I'd like us to pray. Probably even as I have talked, you're not sure that Jesus is in your life, let alone your marriage. And there's a place to invite Jesus into your life. Um, even at this time with this storm, it is not too late to invite Jesus into your life. And so if that is you, I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you uh, to make a prayer or to say a prayer, inviting Jesus into your life. And I'm going to lead you in that prayer. So let us pray. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you so much uh, that even as we close this session, uh, we get such a wonderful picture that you are with us in the storm. But I know that there are some people who are listening who are like, I know that Jesus is not in my life. I don't think Jesus is in my boat with me at this particular time. And I thank you, Lord, that you tell us that we can invite you into our lives at any time. And so at this time, um, we want to invite you. If it is you, I'd like you to repeat this prayer after me and to say, dear Jesus, I confess that I have lived my life by myself. I have been the master of my own life, making all the decisions by myself. I want to ask you for your forgiveness. And I want to ask you to come into my life and to take a hold of my life and to take control. I'd also like to pray for those ones who are like, I know in my marriage, I've never even invited Jesus into my marriage. And so I don't think he's in my boat. I don't think he's in my corner. And so if that is you, I'd like us to invite Jesus to lead you into a prayer, inviting Jesus into your marriage. And I want you to repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that in my marriage, I have had little regard for you. I've not invited you into my marriage. I have taken control of matters in my life and I have not invited you in. As a result, I've experienced a lot of turmoil. And I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for uh, taking matters into my, into, into my hands. I now invite you into my marriage. I invite you into the current storm that I'm experiencing. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you'd calm the storm and that you'd enable us to go through the issues that we are going through in my marriage together with you. For I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So I'd want to say good night. That has been an amazing time. Again, share this video widely with those who you know will need it. Until next time, God bless.